Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome you to one of our online programs, which we started uh, in uh, great order um, and magnitude, uh, starting when the pandemic hit uh, last March. Uh, we've probably done almost 500 of these programs since then. And uh, I'd also like to welcome all of those of you who watch us later on YouTube or Facebook. So today we have a very special um, program. We have Heino Falke coming from um, his place near Cologne, Germany, uh, live streamed directly into our San Francisco uh, offices. And uh, we're here to talk about his book, Light in the Darkness, um, Black Holes, the Universe, and Us. Uh, he is the man who, in charge of the team that took the first image of a black hole. I'm sure many of you remember that uh, event in the news uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, and the process of how that was done, the, the amount of effort that went into it, the huge team uh, that was involved uh, collecting the data and then the computers um, to put all that detail back together again. Uh, it's fascinating because when we think, think of an image, you think of someone just taking a picture with a camera. That's not how this image was done. So Heino, welcome uh, to uh, San Francisco uh, virtually. Um, and thank you for joining us uh, to talk about black holes. It's great to be here virtually indeed. Um, behind me is my university in the Netherlands. I'm sitting in Cologne, I'm near Cologne, and I'm talking in San Francisco. So that's uh, what's possible these days. That is what's possible these days. It's amazing uh, how quickly it shifted. The technology was already there, but since it was the only thing we could do, uh, we turned to that technology and use it all the time now. So you, you uh, put together a really big team over a long time. And I think another thing, the backstory, which you go into in, in your book, um, this was something you've worked on ever since you, almost since you were a little boy, but basically since you were a PhD candidate, um, this was a project that you've been working on. So this is a couple of decades of effort, um, and it's, it's just great that the weather all lined up for the time that it worked, you know, <laughs> because a lot went into this. Um, and, and obviously, you stimulated millions of imaginations throughout the world with this image of a black hole um, that, that those... Uh, abysses, if that's what you, you call it sometimes, or the gates of hell, as you call it, are, are actually real things. Well, let's talk about what they really are. It, it gets very exciting to talk about them as the gates of hell and, and abysses, but there's something much more simple, and you actually talk about it as a simple event. But let's first give everyone an idea about, about this image and how you created it in the sense that uh, you're going to show us something. Yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll show a few slides, and, and let me just say, of course, this was a big team effort. Uh, with 350 scientists around the world. And I was, you know, indeed, it was sort of my dream to see a black hole 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it used to be fantasy. And it was an entire team that, you know, worked together in the US, in Europe, uh, that made this possible in the end. So let me, let me try to share my screen here and hope that works. Um, and then, you know, I'll just briefly talk about what black holes are. So you, yeah, you, you're seeing this uh, wonderful. And uh, you see where the image, you know, the final result. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we talk about black holes, you know, it's uh, these are the most mysterious objects in the universe. Some of the most fundamental objects as well, the limits of space and time where really, you know, we come to the end of our knowledge. Now, black holes aren't really holes. They are filled with an enormous amount of matter that curves space time. That's something that Albert Einstein, his theory of general relativity, told us. And, you know, how do you have to picture a black hole? What he was saying is that mass can curve space and time, that you know, space is not flat, hard to imagine. But so we, we present here a two-dimensional uh, representation. And you, you can think of a black hole as a big waterfall, actually, mm -hmm. where you know, space is falling towards a hole. And what you see there are you know, lamps, which are shoot light rays out. And the closer you come to the cliff, right, to the edge of the uh, of the waterfall, you know, the, the more you have to shoot light rays out, but the, the, the stream will take them back. And once you are actually going over the cliff, there's no way that any, you know, light 
could come out of this object anymore. And if there's no light coming out of this anymore, no information, nothing, no matter, no light, no nothing you can imagine can come out of a black hole. And that that region we call the event horizon, because you know that's the last thing. You know, this is this dark region uh, that you see of an event. Everything happening inside is shielded from our view, is shielded to some degree from our science. And that makes it black hole so uh, insults to physicists because it means you know, <laughs> there is a region, a region, you know, that you can observe in principle, but you cannot, you know, cannot, well, you could touch, but you couldn't, you couldn't, you can't measure. So that was the idea that, you know, that came out of, you know, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, I, I, hope simulate, that, uh, I hope that the physicists don't take this insult personally. Oh, we do take it very personally. <laughs> so we work very hard to overcome this insult and, you know, and find a way around. But we're, we're, that, that's a big fight we're having right now, trying to overcome the event horizon. Well, a big you did, debate. You did a great going. job of giving us a glimpse. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you know, and we're using supercomputers to actually mm -hmm. uh, visualize what black holes do because you know they have a huge amount of mass. There is plasma going around, uh, hot gas which is heating up, and there are plasma streams shooting around along the rotation axis. You see this here. These are actual simulations in, in big supercomputers. You see how the matter goes around; it heats up, uh, it glows. Um, and uh, in the central region, you just see the dark, the darkness of the event horizon. That's where everything disappears in. And so we made a prediction, uh, in fact, starting 25 years ago, how it should look like if you zoom in onto a black hole, looking at the right radio frequencies, you sh should see the dark shadow, as we called it, and this ring of light surrounding it. Mm. Light is bent and, and light disappears. So that's what causes this structure. That's theory. That's just, you know, a weather forecast for black holes, so right. to speak. If you want to see this, you know, this is, you know, some of these black holes can be gigantic because they are the centers of galaxies, you know, sometimes in thousands of light years, in this case, 55 million light years away. Mm -hmm. um, then they are very small. They are tiny. And so you need a huge telescope to see this. And so we needed the world, the world-sized telescopes, and we built one by combining telescopes all around the world. And that's why you need people you know, of all skills, of all, uh, from all continents, to bring their telescopes to create a world-sized telescope. Now you even and then in April, down in, in, in Antarctica. Um, yeah, well, they, they weren't born then, I think most of them, um, as far <laughs> as I know. <laughs> Let's hope no, not. There, were, there is actually, this is actually an American telescope built in, uh, near the South Pole. Mm -hmm. Very near the south pole, you can actually walk there, um, and you have to stay there all night to observe, and that takes six months uh, mm -hmm. for the night to go away. <laughs> so it's a major enterprise. I would had it, I had it much better. I you see it up uh, in top right. I went to Spain near Andal in, in the Andalusia. You get you know very nice Andalusian uh, food, and a wonderful mountain to be on, and <laughs> enjoy uh, the time there. And then being, you know, at a telescope is sometimes like being in a monastery, looking at the sky, you know, thinking about the sky, having your your job to do, and 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 you know, and that's it. That's your little world, and you're looking out into this universe. And we got this data in 2017, and as you said, we were lucky because all around the world the weather was perfect. You know, it hardly ever happens, but you know, yeah. it was wonderful weather. All the technology worked. We were ready to present, you know, the data after you know full year of processing to the world in actually seven press conferences around the world. There was one in Washington. This was the one in, in Brussels where I was sitting mm -hmm. in the big press room where they had just been discussing, you know, Brexit and all kinds of things. You know, uh, with a lot of drama going on at the time, but people were still interested in this black hole. And that's the image I. That's the movie I showed with a little bit of music from my son. Actually, who's making film music. Um, and this is, you know, one of the biggest zooms you can make in, in astronomy. Mm -hmm. You're starting in Chile, looking out into the night sky uh, towards the constellation Virgo, where there is a galaxy, you know, 55 million light years away. This 500 billion billion kilometers or miles, whatever you like. And you zoom further in and you see that galaxy, which you know, is filled, you know, is surrounded by a big bubble of radio-emitting plasma. And 
planets. In the center, there are a thousand billion stars, and if you zoom in, you see this streak of light that comes from the very center that we've seen before. And if you go to its origin, where it comes from, in the end, you're going to see that. And that was the first ever image of a black hole. You know, the darkness in the center and the ring of light surrounding it. It was, you know, everything looked, you know, like you saw jets and jets and jets. And when we came to the very center where we, you know, thought the black hole should be, we saw that ring of light mm -hmm. and uh, and this darkness. And and so we're literally looking at the end of space and time. And this, the, 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 the streaks you see actually is indicates a polarization of light. Mm -hmm. I don't have much to explain this. Yeah. So I'll stop here. This is a short, you know, visual you get, and yeah. then we can talk about it. Stunning picture, and it, it it gives you the idea of light going down the drain instead of instead of water going down the drain, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. It's really you know light going down down the drain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you had a great first. You give really good background in your book at the beginning of of. Where, where, how we got to this uh, state of looking for black holes and, and how quickly and how slowly we got there. Uh, would you tell a great story about um, taking your daughter out um, and, and seeing the moon? And maybe you can tell that story to everybody because I, I thought it was a nice insight into what you're doing. Well, you know, when you're an astronomer, um, you know, one of the, the, the most fascinating things that happened in the history of, of astronomy is, you know, these solar eclipses. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, and there was one, you know, total solar eclipse in Europe at the time in 1999. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you're also depending on the weather. Right. And so this was the once in a lifetime chance you have to see that total eclipse uh, at your hometown. So I was taking my little daughter out of school, actually, I had to plea with the. Uh, it was the principal of the school that I you know, was allowed to take her out because, you know, there is no rule in the German system that allows you to take out the, uh, your, your kid from school because of the solar eclipse. So <laughs> even if you're an astronomer, it's you know, that's <laughs> formally not legal. So I had to do some, you know, legal tricks, you know, to say, I, you know, I declare I'm leaving home for, you know, I'm dissolving my home for, for a day, something like that. For a day, that. yeah. So, yeah. The principal, <laughs> what I found interesting was that the principal would not let you break the rule, but gave you the idea of how to get around it. Yeah, that, that's the way we do bureaucracy in Germany. We have lots of rules. <laughs> everywhere, we everywhere works that way. <laughs> <laughs> and we're chasing it. We're chasing the uh, the solar eclipse, and you know because it was cloudy. It was cloudy all you know all day, and we ended up somewhere in France. And it was just at the right moment. The clouds opened up. We were able to see the sun for a couple of few minutes. We saw this bright ring of light and this dark, you know, on the moon, mm -hmm. uh, the dark moon in front of it, you know, the moon shadow, you could say. Um, and, uh, and it was just an amazing moment when, you know, the, the, the world became dark and you mm -hmm. saw that ring of light. And that was a bit, you know, inspiring because later, you know, we, we had this shadow of the black hole and this, mm -hmm. this, this fiery ring, you know, it, it looks a little bit like a solar eclipse. Yeah. I, I happened to, to, uh, Watch the same eclipse from Frankfurt, uh, right outside the the uh, Opera House um, in in the downtown area. I was working in Frankfurt right at that time, and so everybody went out uh, around lunchtime or so, right, and and uh, watched everything go dark in the middle of the day. It's a very interesting experience, and it's fortunately we we know why it happens now. Um, it, we have records of some of the older ones um, from China. I think are about the oldest, but from other places where because people were so. Uh, uh, intimidated by the experience, right? Yeah, there's a, a story which may not be true, but still sort of, uh, you know, fun to tell. There were some Chinese astronomers who were actually able to predict them, mm -hmm. uh, but they were too drunk to actually uh, pr predict it properly, and so they missed it, and so they were actually, you know, sentenced to death penalty uh, to, um, uh, for, for, for mispredicting astronomical events. So luckily, that doesn't happen to us anymore as astronomers these days. Right. Uh, the but people, we still make errors once in a while. You know, the people so. who run CERN, if they if they couldn't account for all the uh, money that's spent, if that was the death penalty, I think that probably would change the way things were run. <laughs> uh, so you, your, your your daughter came along, and so you got her out of school, and, and she was able to experience that. Has, has she, uh, I mean, most children don't follow in the footsteps of their parents anymore. Um, has she shown an interest in, this, in astronomy? Because this is... 
Yeah, we we have a tradition in our family that you never do what your parents do. Right. So, <laughs> my, my daughter will become a pastor. Actually, ah. she's a, a, she she studied theology and becomes a pastor. My my youngest son is doing music now, mm -hmm. um, and uh, my oldest son is is, is 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 studying management, doing a PhD on management. Uh, you, you in fact, got, he's been working. He's been in in, um, in Stanford uh, for uh, a couple of months uh, during his studies. So you've got business, arts, and religion all covered. It's, it, and you're the scientist. Your your family is. Uh, my, like, my dad is a doctor, a, 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 you know, a, a yeah. physician. So you know, we are covered indeed. My, my wife's a teacher. Um, it, it, the conversations at dinner must be great. <laughs> So, oh, we talk about yeah. Anyway, yeah, we talk about football actually. <laughs> yeah, you did mention you did mention your football team. So um, let's let's talk about a few of the ideas that that led to black holes. Um, you you talk about the history of a lot of other f uh, physics and how that got started. And for example, um, you 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 like many scientists try to put to rest the idea that the ancients uh, all thought the Earth was flat um, because People have this idea up until Columbus, everybody thought it was flat, but that's not true. Why don't you just explain that for 2000 years before that most educated people anyway knew that the earth wasn't flat and how, and how they figured it out because it, it was an early version of the kind of work that you guys do. do. Well, actually, the Greeks already figured it out mm -hmm. uh, and they measured the circumference of the earth um, using, for example, the sun and you, you put out a, you know, a, a pole, so to speak, and you'd see that at different places on the earth, the shadow would have different lengths at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And so from knowing how, uh, how far away uh, those two you know, cities were, where you would measure the lengths of the shadow, uh, you could actually figure out how the size of the Earth. And so the size of the Earth was reasonably well determined yeah. uh, already by the Greeks. And, and people knew that even in the Middle Ages. In fact, the emperors had an, an apple which was symbolizing the earth uh -huh. uh, with a cross on top of it. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. and, and, and that was well before Columbus. Yeah. And uh, so globes were, were fashionable around the time. And so, so yeah, people knew it was, a, uh, it was a surface. They didn't quite understand why you were stuck to the ground. Why didn't you fell off? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and so to, to come up with the idea, there's a force called gravity. Mm -hmm. Now, that took quite a while to figure out. And it was Newton. Who figured it out? Why? Because before that, we understood the solar system mm. and how planets would go around, and that was, of course, a big breakthrough, you know, made by Copernicus, Kepler, and Galilei, mm. three scientists. Some actually affiliated with the church. Actually, church, all three affiliated with the church. Right. Um, <laughs> we only talk about Galileo, but you know, it was a much longer history of of uh, of, of this coming about, and and Kepler was looking for for beauty in the universe you know mm -hmm. he, he couldn't believe that the creator could have made something as as ugly as the old greek system that was describing you mm -hmm. know uh, planets going around in epicycles and epicycles and so forth it was an ugly system <laughs> he figured it out and then kepler found and, and then uh, and newton was able to to you come up with this idea of gravity there is a force that you know masses attract each other right and then uh but he was assuming that actually space is infinite, that gravity is trans transported or the information of gravity is, is happening instantly. So with, you know, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I change a mass here, then, you know, the, the change of gravity will be happening at the same time in the rest of the universe. Mm -hmm. And he was thinking that time was, you know, absolute. Mm -hmm. And that all changed with Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. who, who said that, you know, gravity actually moves with the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Time is relative, space is relative, and it can change. You know, if you have a huge amount of mass concentrated, like in a black hole, for example, then time will go slower. Mm -hmm. Why will it go slower? Because time is nothing you can touch. Time is always only what you measure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist inherently. It's just always what you derive. And, uh, and everything we measure... Uh, in, in our universe is actually using light. We mm. shine light at things. We use light actually as a clock. Mm. Even if you, you hit someone with a hammer, the force that you feel is actually transmitted by your virtual light particles. Mm. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, right. it hits you with a hammer you know, at, at the fundamental molecular level 
you know, the information is transported with the speed of light. So what happens to light will affect everything else, will affect your, the time, the space that you measure, um, and the forces you feel. And it turns out that light is a, a fundamental constant. The speed of light is always constant. It always moves with the same speed. Before we get to the black holes, let's. I have two questions about that you know, big issue. You know, moving from uh, absolute space and time to absolute speed, because uh, speed is is considered a relative thing in almost all other circumstances, um, because it's it, you can you can always make one stationary and the other one move, or they both move at different things, and and it, it's it's in all of our physics, it's, it's a relative phenomenon. So it's interesting that that's a, an absolute. But one thing you just said uh, reminded me of this because you said that time is just, we just it's a measurement of something else. It, it's our, our way of measuring things. And so is it the measurement that's influenced by things as opposed to time itself? Um, I mean, or, or not time itself because time's the measurement, but what is time trying to measure? It's measuring causality, it's, ca it's causing, it's measuring the continuum of change, right? And so, if you, if you, this one is thing a, is made a, is a, a, a big deal about the clocks, you know, the cesium clocks, the atomic clocks, that if you, ch we, we can prove that, that they are adjusted. But doesn't that just mean the clock itself and the way it operates is adjusted at different levels of gravity and so on, as opposed to time itself changing? Yeah, it's a, you know, that's an almost a philosophical question. Maybe it is a philosophical question. Yes, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's a big question what time actually is. What yeah. does it actually tell us? And in fact, what you say is, is right. It actually tells us a, an evolution, a development, how things change. That's what time is. Mm -hmm. But uh, you need things to change, in fact, right? So if you, if you have no matter, you have a completely you know, a, a, a universe which is where, where there's nothing in it. Yeah. Is there time? Because there's no change. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and time is, is always, you know, the, evolu yeah, the evolution of things. And you measure it with, indeed with light. And the clocks that we have today are extremely precise. Um, in, in, in fact, even less precise ones that we use every day, like for the navigation system. If you use the navigation system, the GPS, right, on, on your cell phone, uh, you, you look up where you are, you're using atomic clocks in satellites up on the Earth, uh, out in, 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 in space, well above the Earth. Mm -hmm. And they run faster than they run here uh, on Earth. Mm -hmm. So really, things are going faster up there than down here. 38 microseconds per day. Doesn't sound like much, mm -hmm. but it sort of, you know, translates into some like 10 kilometers uncertainty on the ground if you don't correct for this. So um, it's the, the curvature of space-time, the curvature of space-time that, that Albert Einstein predicted mm -hmm. changes time. We measure it and we use it every day. All right. So I won't go into that argument a little bit more because it, 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 you can look at it from two different points of view. You could see the curvature of space-time, but you could also say that the clock itself, the material of the clock, is being influenced by gravity and less gravity and more gravity and the other, the other momentum of other things around it. That also could be the cause of the influence. But let's, let's go to, to, to light for a sec, the speed of light. Um, momentum we have in three different ways, right? Generally, when momentum is transferred from one to a, uh, object to another, it's either forward momentum or it's a spin or it's internal um, temperature increases. Right. So we say that the speed of light is absolute, but we do know from all of the, the uh, uh, evidence from astronomy, and it's used all the time, that the source of light, whether it's moving in one direction or another, causes red shifts or blue shifts. So that changes something about light in just the same relative way that other things are. Is that like maybe the forward momentum is always the same, but another part of the momentum it shifts relatively? Yeah. So, so what's happening, and that, that's so you know it's astounding and counterintuitive, yeah. is that if you you know move with almost the speed of light, right, and you shoot a laser, you know, in front of you, uh, you you know it doesn't move. The laser doesn't move with twice the speed of light. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you see it, you know, as as the one in the starship, mm -hmm. you know, you see it moving with the speed of light, mm -hmm. and your neighbor who's at rest also see it see it moving at the speed of light. Uh, so how, how can that be? 
you know, that, that just, you know, it becomes completely counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. So what does happen is, is that not the speed changes, mm -hmm. but the energy that you infer, right? The frequency that you infer for the light. So you know, if if you, you know, if if I'm flying towards you, shooting a laser at you, uh, coming with the speed of light, you will see the laser much bluer before you die. But you know, <laughs> you see. <laughs> That you see it blue shifted, <laughs> right? And someone looking from behind, you know, in in in, in safety, you know, uh, right. you know, see it go away. It actually uh, will see it uh, red shift. So the frequency changes, not the speed. Right. Uh, and the frequency is a measure of time. And right. uh, and and so that's where the time comes in. Yeah. I, and if I, you I, if you think about you know just uh, speed, what is speed? It's mm -hmm. you know miles per hour, mm -hmm. right? And so if you say that the speed is constant, then the ratio between the two could still, you know, is constant, but individually they can change. So if you have more miles because the phase is curved, mm -hmm. also time needs to change in order, the time that you measure will change in order to keep the same speed. So that's, that's a, you know, the, 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 the basic the strange idea. thing. We, we always think of, of, of space and time to be constant, but, you know, the theory of light actually tells us the speed of light is constant. Mm -hmm. The ratio between space and time, you know, is constant. But individually, they can change. Yeah. And so now let's go to black holes, and we're on the event horizon. Um, and and as you showed from your picture, uh, instead of light moving forward, um, it's captured as if it's going to go down a drain, and it's it's, it's spinning around. Um, and you you said actually you could probably if you if the light bounces off, you could see your back. You know, maybe that one time in the in your life, you could see your back without a mirror. Um, but the, the light spinning around the, the, the black hole like that on its way to being pulled in uh, is a, a relatively fascinating capture of light um, because it's moving at almost, well, it's moving at the speed of light and other material is moving up almost at the speed of light around the black hole before it goes into it. Um, so it, it seems, it's, but, but again, you're saying that, that never will any material move faster than the speed of light relative to something else. Absolutely, yeah. The, the plasma that you saw streaming around, actually, it looked like it was sort of you know, a slow-moving thing. But yeah. you know, remember, uh, the black hole that we're talking of here uh, you know, can have the size of a solar system. And, um, and so it actually moves really close to the speed of light. This is the fastest plasma you, you can have. Mm -hmm. And that's why it becomes so hot. You know, this, because, you know, if you have mass colliding uh, and with speed of light, right, you have, you know, the higher, you have a car crash, right? Yeah. The, the higher the speed, you know, the more damage you will make. Now, if you have a car crashing into another car with the speed of light, it'll be just complete <laughs> demolition. It's just uh, and, what they try and, to do in the so cyclotrons, right? Basically, almost, you know, in, in the cyclotrons. So like at CERN, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what, what we can do with individual do, particles. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do it with collectively with, with, with plasma, it will become extremely hot and radiate. And that's why, in fact, black holes can be very efficient uh, energy emitters. So if you just pour 10 buckets of water into a black hole, it will heat up. It will be actually radiating its energy. And you can use actually, you know, I calculated once, you can provide all the Netherlands with energy for an entire year. Mm -hmm. uh, these are 60 million people. Uh, you can have, you know, with one ten buckets of, of, of water, you know, you're a rich person. Um, we we, and, we, we uh, need to find a way to get it from there to here, and then we won't have an energy problem. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Just getting there, you will cost a lot of energy in the first place. So, you know, and, and you don't want to have a black hole too close to it. That's a, that's a bit of the problem here. That's, you, uh, yeah, yeah. you mentioned in your book how efficient the sun is, too. I think what, what your example there was if, if our bodies were as efficient as the sun, that we would only we could live a whole lifetime on a, a half a gram of food or something like that. Some yeah, something I, I forgot my own numbers. I have to read my book, but you know that's that's about <laughs> but that's some about some it, yeah. incredibly small amount of food. Yeah, it, what what a, what a poor life would that be, right? If we just have you know one you know one milligram of a grapefruit to eat uh, a salad, <laughs> you know, for our entire life, you know. Let's see. I don't Luckily, we're not as efficient. Yeah, food would not be such a big part of our of our culture uh, 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 would, if that was true. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> French, French is, you know, gastronomy right down the drain. Uh, you know, <laughs> just... There'd be no point in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, let's talk about the project. 
and how you made this happen. What was interesting was all of the bureaucratic details too. Collecting the money, uh, you got the Spinoza Prize, you know, you needed that to, co to make somebody else put in money. It sounded just like a normal business deal. I was a, I was a lawyer, uh, you know, doing uh, mergers and acquisitions. It sounded like you guys were a big team trying to put together all of the pieces uh, to a project. How much did it, you, you don't have to tell us, but how much did it cost all together? How much did it raise? It was, it was certainly more than 15 to $20 million, right? Yeah, it's it's very difficult to to sum it up because we're using existing infrastructures. We're equipping right. it. There's certainly several tens of, of millions of dollars that mm -hmm. you know the experiment cost in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, some was in kind contributions, um, uh, you know, and some big grants. We got 14 million euros uh, from the European Research Council. There were mm -hmm. you know a big grant from the NSF for about eight, nine, ten million dollars, and many you know grants before that were necessary to build this up. And you were collecting this money all around the world. These are not just dollars, euros, they were yens and, mm -hmm. and, and all kinds of currencies that went into this, this project. And, uh, and in the end, you know, you have to come together as a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And we had like 13 stakeholders institutions which formed that collaboration, but in the end, 60 different institutions participated with 300 scientists. Mm -hmm. and, and, and setting up that organization essentially from scratch mm -hmm. on a very short timeline um, was a very, you know, interesting process. Let's put it that way. You know, it's, <laughs> it was like United Nations uh, international cooperation. It wasn't just, you know, one, one group dominating everybody else. You know, we had lots of scientists, capable scientists around the world, you know, egos, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, people who want to, you know, take the lead. And, you know, we have to find a place for everybody and, and find some compromise to, uh, to, to set up a collaboration. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it was certainly interesting. You could have written an entire book, I think, about you know, sociology and politics and whatever, you know, in science about how, how this works. It was quite an interesting period. Yeah, when I read what you did include in the book, I thought, I, I wonder if any of the tech companies went to Heino afterwards and asked him if he, he wanted to be their CEO. Because you have to deal with people exactly in about the same way to try to create those situations. Um, Certainly, if you, if you work internationally, and mm -hmm. I mean the, the 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 advantage you know a big company like tech company has these days. Of course, they have a lot of money and and, and power, and, and more centrally organized. We are much more a loose bunch of of mm -hmm. uh, institutions around the world that have to work together, and we do it you know because we want to, mm -hmm. not be, because we are paid to do it. Because we're really driven by you know, fascination and, and, and curiosity. We wanted to see that black hole. Mm -hmm. All of us wanted to see that black hole. And that made us work. Yeah. And so but we're also competitors to some degree, mm -hmm. right? And sure. so our call is sometimes competitive collaboration. Um, <laughs> so you, you know, or collaborative competition, you know, whatever you like. Um, and uh, you have to find the right rules and, you know, doesn't all, you know, not in all details, it works. I mean, there have been difficult periods and there have been fantastic periods of, of fellowship and, uh, and, and also struggle. You compared in your book, um, uh, the excitement, uh, for the picture to the first, uh, moon landings, moonshot, that kind of thing. Um, why do you think it is? Because as a boy, I thought, you know, this is so exciting you know, that we're going to the moon and all that kind of stuff. This could take the place of war. Uh, I was a teenager. <laughs> well, this could take the place of war in terms of people being excited. It, it's a ad big adventure. Everyone can watch the adventure and it's not so damaging and we learn things, et cetera, et cetera. But people lost interest relatively quickly. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't think they will ever totally lose interest in space and what's going on out there. But each, each new thing has got to grab back at the people's attention. Now there are, a few million people whose attention never wanders, right? But, but uh, what do you think about that? Because you certainly got a lot of attention uh, when this came out. And so how did yeah. that feel? Yeah, how did that go? It, it, that was an amazing period. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it doesn't last. But, you know, for these few days, it was just amazing. I was, uh, we were told it was like four and a half billion people who saw that image. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking with a guy from BBC who told, told me that the story about that black hole was their most popular story ever. Mm -hmm. uh, more than a major celebrity news and uh, and some some major wars in the uh -huh. in the web page. I couldn't quite believe it. So I you know I still don't believe it, but it certainly was high up there in terms uh -huh. of uh, reception and interest. And I 
the, maybe the most interesting, you know, aspect was, you know, I was, you know, watching my son playing soccer every every weekend, and you know, people, you know, the kids, you know, they are playing. What's well, actually not kids anymore? They we're young adults, really. Yeah. By now, uh, they, they never really knew my name, right? And uh-huh. so, um, and they usually don't watch science news, to be honest. You know, no, most no, of the right. players. There. <laughs> um, and, and the day and, and the week, you know, the weekend thereafter, they all had seen it. They all had, had you know, mm-hmm. uh, they knew about it, and suddenly, you know. It, they, you know, recognize I was there too. So, yeah. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> but of course, you know, for you know, the attention span of people is, is a few days, few weeks, and then they, you know, it, it, it blends out. But there are a few, as you said, a few million who are, who are inspired by this, right? Yeah. Who are like like me. I, when I was a kid, I saw people running around on the moon, and I, I was inspired. It made me go into science, mm-hmm. and maybe we inspire some kids here in, in the U.S. or somewhere in Africa. You know, maybe a little girl who becomes the next Einstein, yeah, uh, and comes up with you know a revolutionary idea about space and time because we need that still. Yes, we there do. are still some <laughs> deep mysteries we surrounding. Yeah, we won't gravity. talk too much about the fight between uh, relativity theory and quantum mechanics. That's for a different thing. But but there, there's a reason why you just said that. We we, we do need something. That that uh, figures out how these uh, ideas either merge together, what what each has to give, or has to be replaced by something else that 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 steps back a little bit further and and understands it. Um, but let's talk. I mean, everybody here is watching about black holes, so let's talk a little bit about how they went from, you know, theory that it might happen, to actually everyone started to think they probably did exist probably in the 90s right mm. something like that mm-hmm. when when it, it was there was a lot of slow movement towards it but the, it's interesting you mentioned in your book uh, somebody predicted there'd be a dark star because the uh, gravitational pull would be strong enough that it would be greater so the escape vo- velocity from that dark star would be greater than the speed of light and therefore nothing could escape it um, I forget which scientist did that. Why don't you tell that? Reverend John Mitchell was in yeah. the 18th century, indeed. Yeah, again a pastor. Right, yeah. So lots of clergymen who actually worked on gravity. <laughs> Besides Lemaitre, well, we'll, we'll talk about him later. Yes, but but so and, he, and, and Newton. He, Newton was a theologian at the time, so it, it was essentially all theologians, <laughs> <laughs> except Einstein, uh, who wasn't, uh, wasn't a theologian, but. Uh, um, yeah, well, no, it was, did spend Mitchell, yeah, because people knew at the time mm-hmm. that that speed, that, that light had a speed. You know, right. People had measured it. It was astronomers, uh, Waldo Roma and 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 um, uh, um, uh, that was a Dutch guy. Sorry, I forgot his name. Anyway, um, <laughs> Huygens, I should know. Huygens, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're measuring the speed of light based on the the uh, moons of of, of Jupiter. Mm-hmm. They used that as a clock, and they saw that it was, you know, uh, delayed, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we roughly knew that. And, and Mitchell said, you know, if if there's a star which has such a strong gravity that you know light cannot escape, it will be a dark star. Mm-hmm. And that was the idea of a black hole already. Um, that was, you know, a bit. You know, it was a, a short idea. I don't think it, you know, it really captured, you know, imaginations that much. Mm-hmm. Then when Einstein developed his theory in in, in 1915, it was, you know. Called Schwarzschild, um, who came up with a solution of a black hole. He didn't know it was a solution of a black hole. He was just calculating mathematically what happens with a, with a point source. And he was actually he wasn't a black hole himself because he was in the trenches of World War One. Mm-hmm. And, and in the theory, you know, it appeared that there was this this weird surface, you know, what we now call the event horizon, mm-hmm. where you know light couldn't escape. And that was just the math of it. Mm-hmm. And Einstein didn't believe that that would exist. He didn't believe that something like a black hole could actually form. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he realized that there's some math, but something you know weirds going on, and probably that that doesn't exist. And it, you know, it took Oppenheimer to prove Einstein wrong. Einstein wrote a paper in the 30s mm-hmm. that you know I, the black holes couldn't couldn't exist, mm-hmm. and he was proven wrong by Oppenheimer, the father of the the atom bomb. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so and, and then you know Penrose in the sixties he just got the Nobel Prize last year showed right. that you know relativity naturally produces black holes so it's almost unavoidable that they could form mm-hmm. and then quasars were were found around the same time mm-hmm. um, that was in fact his uh, motivation that quasars were found these were very bright regions and galaxies far away mm-hmm. and you could show that they had to be very massive very small how you can produce how can you produce so much light in such a small region 
Mm -hmm. The easiest answer was suddenly black holes. It was also the most exotic and crazy answer you could have at the time. But, you know, there, you know, the idea was maybe black holes could exist. And maybe black holes form out of stars. That was the other idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see how, how it developed over, it took decades for this idea to become, you know, you know slowly mainstream. And when I, when I was doing my PhD, the old astronomers were still saying, oh, we don't know about these black holes, well, they're real, and, mm -hmm. and you know, it's not proven. And, you know, there was a lot of deal of skepticism, mm -hmm. but we found more and more evidence, you know, in the centers of galaxies, there was something dark lurking mm -hmm. in, you know, a lot of energy produced, even in our own Milky Way. Mm -hmm. and that you know was one thing that triggered me, and uh, well, you would still have to see it. Yeah. <laughs> we knew something dark was lurking there, and you know, we you'd still have to come close to the event horizon. That's what we did in the end. Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, once they were there, you can look back at all the pictures of the different galaxies and say, well, it looks like there's a drain in the middle of all of them. You know, I mean, uh, some of them are just getting started, some of them, but, but once they have formed for a while, they all form, or, or so many of them form in this spiral kind of thing, and it looks like everything is going down a drain, uh, right? But, I mean, not down a drain, but right in the center, everything is being pulled yeah. towards the center. Um, anyway, yeah, it, I, it, it's... It, that's correct. That's correct. And, and, you know, it looks like you look at spiral galaxies, like, you know, yeah. you see, and it looks like stuff going, going in, uh, in into the center. And that's true. But we can show that most of this stuff actually forms stars. And, and when stars form, they actually go supernova at some point. And so they explode and then they, they shoot out the gas. So it's not at all clear that all the mass actually goes really very much to the center. Right. That, that was a big problem for a long time. This, you know, all this mass that accumulates in a galaxy really make it all the way down to the ultimate drain mm -hmm. that are black holes. And uh, we now know they do. One of the facts that just reminded me that you said is that in our solar system, 99% of the mass is in the sun. You know, the, the, and, and we know that atoms, 99% of the mass is in, is in the nucleus. You know, or I mean, I don't know if it's 99, but it, it, that's where most everything is. And, and in the galaxies, it sounds like if the black holes are large enough that a very high proportion of the mass, maybe not 99% of the galaxy might be in the center as well. Not quite true, actually. Uh -huh. uh, galaxies are an exception um, because the black hole is actually tiny compared to the mass of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. If you just from the center of our galaxy, if you go out just a few light years, then all the stars you have millions of stars in just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a few light years radius. And that's all the mass you have in the black hole. So if you are at our distance mm -hmm. from uh, the center of the Milky Way, there are hundreds of billion stars in between us, mm -hmm. so vastly more massive than the black hole itself. But then there's even this dark matter, right? right. So uh, this invisible component of the universe that we that we don't know what it is, but it fills galaxies mm -hmm. and it makes up, uh, you know, in the central region half, in the outer regions, you know, 90% of, uh, of all the matter in a galaxy is in some form of a dark thing. Um, so in, in, in a sense, galaxies are, you know, more democratic. So it's not all the mass <laughs> in one point in the very center. Yeah, it's more distributed. The wealth is more distributed. Uh, I think a good thing. And, um, uh, but there, the mystery is actually bigger because there's a lot of dark stuff, you know, in the very center mm -hmm. and in the outer regions in terms of dark matter. Yeah, I, people, we're here to talk about black holes, but dark matter and dark energy are, are, are part of the, this whole picture. Um, and, you know, for those of you, uh, for those who, who uh, are trying to understand or, or get an image of what's going on, to be presented with a, an answer that's based on math, uh, that means 95% of, of the universe is unseeable or undetectable at this point, um, sounds a lot like the hand of God almost, uh, you know, in, in, in the sense that you're saying, uh, yes, we know that there's an effect and therefore there must be some source of that effect. Um, so it, the, the, the logic sounds similar. Yeah, you, you measure something. Uh, we, we can measure it, right? So um, measure it or its it, effect. It's we no, we measure its effect. And yeah. In fact, almost everything that we measure is just the effect of. Right. 
Right. <laughs> As I said, you know, if, you, if you hit by a hammer, you're in the the essence. In essence, they're just exchanging virtual virtual uh, 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 photons, right? So, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you're measuring it. Um, yeah, you always in science, you're always measuring just the effect, not the thing itself. So mm -hmm. the measurement process is 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 very important. Um, you mentioned this in the line, of course. Yeah. Sorry? You, you mentioned this in, in your book, and I wanted to bring that out because you're saying uh, one of the things you say is that uh, there is no perfect picture of reality except for reality itself. Um, and, and I think if people understand that, I mean, obviously, to, to say this is what the universe is, you'd have to completely reproduce the universe. Of course, there'd be no material to do it with, so you, you can't do it. Everything else is a map, a measurement, a, a, a way of understanding the principles. And I think the more people understand that about science um because i think visually it doesn't doesn't strike them that way um and i, I think that that's a very important thing to understand about science because that's why our theory keeps changing or it keeps uh, evolving because we keep getting a better map or or sometimes we just get a different map that measures something different um and gives us a different viewpoint like like to use the infrared rather than to use visual light you, you get a totally different picture but you're still measuring the same reality that you're trying to measure you just have a kind of different way to map it and that that is absolutely important, and mm. and that also is you know it's very fundamental um, because we're never able to actually measure everything and know everything precisely. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's it's you can show it's it's impossible to predict things precisely, mm -hmm. uh, and so that also gives us freedom as 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 human being, beings. I think uh, you know in the nineteenth century, people were thinking of the world as a you know determined. Everything was determined. Everything was 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 set in stone, literally, right? Uh, and you, if you just you knew now how the system is, you could exactly predict how it would be in the future. Mm -hmm. And that is impossible to do. Even though we understand the laws of physics better and better, mm -hmm. they're just, as you, as you say, just a map, a mathematical description. Um, but we, we don't even know all the detailed properties of the universe it, itself. And if we would know, that would once more affect the universe. So, right. you know, it's impossible to predict. It's impossible to predict the weather. It's impossible to predict what a human will do. It's possible to predict roughly how climate change. It's possible to, to predict sometimes what a big crowd of people is doing, mm -hmm. even though, I mean, I guess, you know, if you could do this perfectly, you would win all the Nobel Prizes in economics. <laughs> um, so, you know, <laughs> that, that doesn't it, seem to be possible either. Um, but at least collectively, you know, yeah. It's easier with, with, with uh, particles than it is with people. Um, uh, absolutely. But, yes, but, that's uh, why but, I'm glad I'm a physicist. But what so. you just said about, about this overall prediction of climate and so on, the sort of a general thing, that's that reminiscent of quantum mechanics. It, 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 it's a, a, a probability theory that predicts uh, what the overall outcome is mean. It does it so well, but it doesn't really tell us what's exactly happening in, in the details. Yes, and right. that's why, you know, if you have a big crowd, I mean, you know roughly what people will do, but what mm -hmm. each individual will do is, uh, is, is unpredictable. And what your fate is, you know, is, is also unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And there's always, you know, a different outcome is always possible, even in physics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, um, so you're one of the scientists who believe we still might have free will. I am absolutely convinced that we have free will yeah. and we have a, you know, a, a responsibility because of that. Yeah. So um, we, we, we'll see if there's a time at the end to, to go into your final chapter. But, uh, but let's, let's make sure that everybody gets as clear an idea about black holes as, as we can from this. Uh, that's what they are you know, here for, this image, and also uh, just how that came about. So in the 90s, when people started to get convinced that black holes really did exist. Um, I mean, not just a few scientists, but lots and lots of people. And it, it looked clear that there probably were black holes in the centers of many galaxies. And there are also these much smaller black holes just from, from one star or whatever, but that, that then explode right away um, because they don't have much mass. It, you, at that time, in the middle of that is when you got this project started pretty much, right? When you, when you started to put together the concept of what we're going to try to do, and and then over time, put the pieces together. Everything starts with an idea and, and a vision, yeah. and and it's never you know 
just you know one person of course right you always pull things together different you know, technologies and ideas mm -hmm. and you know i was doing my phd at the time and it was you know and i was doing working on on, on black holes in general but at the, but at the time they were first evident that the center of our milky way would host the supermassive black holes the people measuring the stars mm -hmm. uh going around the, the central region and i was producing a model and i realized there's light coming directly from the event horizon. You know, there's light around, surrounding the darkness. And, and I was wondering, can we see that? And there was a technology developed at the time by the radio community that, you know, combining world, building world-sized telescopes. Mm -hmm. um, and so putting, you know, and there was one piece still missing. And, and one thing I, because, you know, I ca was calculating how big that, that, that black hole would be. And it was just too small for a world-sized telescope. Yeah. I'd forgotten one thing, namely that black holes, you know, all gravitational lenses, they magnify themselves. They appear bigger mm -hmm. than they actually are, which is good. They're sort of, you know, little giants. Um, <laughs> and that just made them, you know, and I, I found this, was just reading an old book just accidentally. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, this just occurred to me, yes, we can see it. We can see that black hole. We can mm -hmm. see it actually in the next 10 years. Well, I was totally wrong. It took 20 years, but yeah. you know, that was pretty close. Uh, it, it was close enough. Factor yeah. two for astronomers is actually a good guess. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then you have to start, you know, convincing people, talking with people, and you have to find allies. And, and, and then suddenly, you know, it, it, it boils and, and, uh, and the idea, you know, gets a life of its own. And then suddenly, you know, people do experiments sometimes, you know, without you. And, you know, <laughs> and you have to see that you stay, stay in the race. And that's, you know, you know it's, it's a, an interesting process. And I would say around in the middle of the 2000s, people were starting to convince that, you know, it should be possible to actually see a black hole. Mm -hmm. Like ten, after 10 years of talking, community said that should be possible. It took another 10 years to get the money uh, and um, in the good weather. You know, start the experiment. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you had to choose between, you, were, you went after two different ones, um, but one proved to be possible and the other one didn't work out, right? Secretarius, uh, I, I wouldn't say that. Oh, we uh -huh. actually, the one that we were hunting actually is the center of Milky Way because there we knew mm -hmm. very precisely how how mass massive it is. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one, you know, which was factor two thousand further away, mm -hmm. but potentially factor two thousand more massive. Right. But the measurements were uncertain. When I did my PhD, the mass was three times smaller than people now estimate. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, what we talked about in science. You know, science is evolving. Um, the, the error bars become smaller, systematic errors, which were, you know, were in, uh, affecting those measurements. And, and by the time we're doing these observations, it was clear there was a good chance that this other black hole, which is much further away, would be almost as large on the sky mm -hmm. as the one in the center of our Milky Way, mm -hmm. because it was just so gigantically massive. Mm -hmm. And so we just, it was a lucky shot. You know, we were looking at it. We weren't quite sure. And when we saw it, it really, you know, blew our minds. You know, mm -hmm. it surprised us uh, mightily. And the other one we're still working on. So, you know, wait and see you know, what comes out. Um, we're still working on the data. There's so more uh, that we have. So to give people an idea, uh, you have several analogies in, in your book about how small this is. Um, so if you're sitting in Europe and you're looking at something in Washington D.C. and you're trying it, in this black it's hole, it's about a mustard seed. It's it's, it's mustard, you know a millimeter or whatever. You'd, yeah. you'd have to be able to read the New York Times, well, say the Washington Post, uh -huh. in uh, in <laughs> Washington to uh, uh, to to uh, from, from Europe. From know? Europe. Um, and that, and that's what now how how did we get to be able to look that far that precisely? What do we, I mean, we're not obviously using optical telescopes or anything. We're using the data that comes in. But how, how did that happen? How did we push out that far? Because that's all happened within the last hundred years, right? And even, even probably less time. It, 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 it's because we're using radio technology. Uh, uh -huh. and, and that's something that actually came out of World War II. You know, if mm. we go back into history. Um, it, yes, you know, the, the first cosmic radio detection was done in the 30s by, you know, Carl Gutejansky in, in the U.S. You found mm -hmm. that the, you know, the universe is making radio noise. You know? mm -hmm. It's a static background. Um, but after World War II, there were lots of, you know, radar technology was developed. 
in, in fact, in, in the UK, Royal Air Force people were, uh, you know, turning into radio astronomers. Mm -hmm. In Australia, in the US, uh, that happened in the Netherlands, which was this, became a strong radio astronomy place. And they were listening to the radio sounds from the universe. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time we were doing astronomy with light other than the light we see with our eyes, mm -hmm. uh, with radio light. Right. And that's where suddenly, you know, telescopes, radio dishes became radio telescopes. Mm -hmm. The problem of radio is it's sort of long wavelengths. Uh, you don't have a high resolution. You know, I've come from, from, um, from, I did my studies in, near Bonn in Germany, where we had the Effelsberg 100 meter radio telescope, 100 meter sized mm -hmm. uh, telescope. Uh, it's, it's gigantic, but it doesn't have a better resolution than your, your eye. Mm -hmm. Because radio is such a long, small wavelength. So you have to make bigger and bigger radio telescopes to actually see sharper. Mm -hmm. And that was a discovery that was made in the you know, 60s, 70s, that you can combine radio telescopes. It's mm -hmm. called interferometry. And then you can synthesize the telescope, uh, the size of the separation of the telescopes. And then the next step was to go to continental differences, uh, distances. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so people were already in the in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, building you know, world-sized telescopes. And, and was, then the I next step is you have... made to... possible by computers that can analyze the data. Absolutely. I mean, it you would take too to many actually... people to, 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 to go through that information. It was, in the end, it was the uh, information uh, revolution that we had because we had to store... We, we are storing, actually, radio light on hard drives. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're storing five petabyte of of data mm -hmm. which is just noise radio noise turned into bits and bytes mm -hmm. that's what we do but then we have a digital copy of the light received at each of the telescopes mm -hmm. and then we could do what a normal telescope does you know a, a, a telescope or dish you know, it reflects the light mm -hmm. and then it bundles it in the focus okay what we do is you no, know, we we don't have a dish. We just have many little dishes. We 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 store the data, mm -hmm. and then the, the bring it together in the focus. We do in the computer, mm -hmm. and that requires a lot of bandwidths, a uh, huge amount of data storage. Uh, there were thousands of hard drives that you know went to the tele telescopes, mm -hmm. uh, te many terabytes of six terabyte uh, hard drives. We store it. We have an atomic clock at each of the telescopes to actually synchronize mm -hmm. all the radio light, and then only later. In the computer, we form uh, the actual image, and that's an involved process uh, to make this happen. But in the end, we're just recreating what a camera would do. Yeah, you just just have to be that precise. You you even uh, say that uh, because there are uh, continual adjustments in in the orbit and stuff like that, that there are very very tiny but still adjustments that need to be made uh, in the data uh, based on that. You need to keep the, the distance or measure the distances to fractions of millimeters. Right. And in fact, everything plays a role. You actually, the, the, the tides actually will, will, will change the crust <laughs> by half a meter. Um, the, the, there's continental drift, mm -hmm. uh, actually a few a millimeter per year that mm -hmm. you can measure this way. Um, I once was told, you know, in Sweden, you have a radio station and actually, you know, it, it rises up. Why? Because the ice age is gone and you know, the ice is gone. So the telescope is still rebouncing from the <laughs> end of the ice age. Uh, the Earth is actually wobbling um, and because of the planets are pulling on it. And, to, you know, and there's several meters uh, per year. It's actually randomly wobbling around. And that's because there is the oceans are not stable. There's some more air on one side of the Rockies and on the other, something like that, you know, you know makes the, the Earth a bit unstable. All these things we have to correct for in the end. Um, luckily, we have models for this established, and the rest we can you know, measure. We can actually use cosmic sources to get very precise measurements of our locations and correct the time. In fact, we correct the atomic clocks with our <laughs> measurements. Um, which reminds me of one story, which I think is a great one, about the woman who, who figured out uh, that, that we could use uh, quasars or, or pul pulsars as atomic clocks. Why don't you tell her story? Because that's, that's one of those stories that, that's really useful in science to figure out you know, where, where our information well, came from. Yeah. It's actually Jocelyn Bell Burnell. She wrote actually a foreword for, 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 for our book. Ah. And that's a fascinating story. They were looking actually for something different. They were looking at quasars. They wanted to look at the variation. And they found this one source uh, which was regularly giving pulses, you know. Mm -hmm. And they were scared because they thought, you know, what? You know, and they knew it was cosmic. It was a cosmic signal. Mm 
-hmm. It was so precise and accurate, like a perfect clock, as you say, like an atomic clock, in fact, we, we now know. Um, and they were first scared, and they called it LGM, Little Green Men. Uh, <laughs> no, LGM-1 and LGM-2, because they found two of them. Um, and, and it turned out to be neutron stars. So the, the, you know, the, the core of a star, which was, you know, after explosion of a star, collapsed. And, you know, it, it keeps rotating very stably. And you can do an enormous uh, amount of science with it. And if it becomes too heavy, it actually will collapse into a black hole. Uh -huh. And that was a monumental discovery for which her supervisor and colleagues got the Nobel Prize, but she didn't. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, and uh, it was the, you know, 60s and 70s, you know, for her, it wasn't wasn't so funny, I think, in the end. Uh -huh. um, but she, in fact, became famous for, you know, uh, more famous for not getting the Nobel Prize than for getting the Nobel Prize. And I think that's sort of the justice in the end. Yeah. And it doesn't uh, she's a wonderful, like that. wonderful woman and colleague in yeah. our field. It doesn't always happen like that, but, but have patience if you're a, a grad student someplace doing the work. <laughs> it might work out. Sometimes, as you said, sometimes the stories of not winning something. Uh, there's, there's Oscar uh, nominations that uh, people who never got the Oscar that are the same thing. You get, you get more fame from not having gotten it than you did from, from getting it. I still hope she'll get it. Uh, I, mean, yeah. there's still, I mean, there's still a chance to, to correct that. That's great. So we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, and so um, I'm, I'll ask those uh, first. Uh, this one comes from Wonderfest Science. Dr. Falke, will we ever understand the continuity of nature? That is, why are the laws of physics the same today as they were yesterday and will be tomorrow? <laughs> very good question. I, and that is a very <laughs> fundamental uh, assumption that we make. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it also ties a little bit into, again, you know, um, a fundamental concept of the universe. Like if you look at sort of the, 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 the Christian picture of God, right? It's the mm -hmm. same in the past, now, and the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find the same in, in nature. Um, at least, you know, for this universe, that seems to be the case. And if that would not have been the case, um, our universe just wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 it would, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to predict anything. We, we couldn't, we couldn't make any decisions. It would be just be total chaos. So we, we're very lucky um, that we have a, a constancy of, of the, the natural laws. And what are they actually? I mean, laws are abstract things. You, you can't touch a, a, a natural uh, fundamental law, right? right? I mean, it's, it's, again, it's a map. It's something happening in our mind, but still it describes our universe. So there's some constantly underlying this universe, you know, and in fact, some identif identify this with God. Some others just call this, you know, natural laws. Mm -hmm. Some stability is there. Of course, there are people who say, you know, maybe these laws change. You know, every time you have a new universe, maybe you have multiple universes. Mm -hmm. The laws of, of physics change. Um, but even then, I think, you know, before that, you have to have some some structure which allows you at least, you know, to have some reasonable natural laws to emerge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, the it's, you know, we don't know why this is the case. We just don't know. We're just lucky that it is the case. Otherwise, signs wouldn't be possible. Well, it's, it's, it's like the inherent pattern in what we, what's out there. There's an inherent pattern. You can't touch it, like I said, but it's a, it's a law. It's, a, it's the way it always operates. Um, and and uh, you mentioned Pythagoras in your, in your book um, uh, just briefly, but he, he said it's not chaos, which was, was the basic idea of, of the ancient Greeks, but it's cosmos, it's, it's order. There's an order to what's going on. Um, now, what that order is has been taking us you know, 2,500 years and, and how much of the order we have, um, what percentage we have, whether it's 1% or 5% or 10%, uh, we, we really don't know yet, but um, we're, we've made a lot of progress. And, do you think that that progress, for one thing, I think uh, we, we know that there's so much order and continuity that it's hard to accept this other theory that, that time is discrete units and that the whole universe is recreated every moment because, uh, you know, that would, that would take a, a, a magic trick of uh, enormous uh, a, and a deceptive magic trick because it doesn't look at all like that. It looks like a continuum, right? So... That is, I mean, there are some ideas of quantum uh, theory which say, you know, essentially every every time you know a decision happens, you you create something like a new parallel universe, so right. to speak. I have a hard time uh, picturing that really, um, and uh, and you know, this is one of the fundamental limits we, we are approaching now on the smallest scale, understanding mm -hmm. what quantum physics is. 
Yeah. And also on the larger scales, you know, where does the universe come from? Where does it go to? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we are going to the ends of space and time. We are, um, we are fighting maybe our last and most important battle because we're trying to overcome now you know, the limits imposed by the event horizon and black holes. Mm -hmm. But it could be that these, these limits persist, these frontiers that we will never be able to know. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, which may not be, you know, too bad either, because then it will keep the mystery, which I think is, is not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes us keep searching and thinking. Well, like the thing that gave us some idea about the kind of, like the law of the conservation of mass energy. That idea is, you know, that... It, it, everything is just being reorganized, more or less. Um, that, that whatever it is, exists, and then it's in a new form, a new form, a new form, but nothing disappears, and nothing is gained. Um, and that, I, I think, is another sign that this is a continuum rather than a bunch of discrete time units uh, well, well, being recreated. But, of course, you know, you should not forget the mass and energy conservation does not apply to the entire universe, because the... The universe essentially is expanding. It's sort right. of there's dark energy, which makes it expand faster. But also there's the entropy is growing. There's a chaos in the universe is, is growing as we speak. So we are actually using up energy and, and order uh, from the universe. And uh, as far as we can, can tell for now, it's a one time shot. I mean, it's, you know, it, it will disperse away the universe and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it. Whether something new comes about is very unclear. It's, it's, it's definitely we, at this point nothing pointing to it. But we do have a few billion years left for those who are, are worried that it's. Yeah, if you're patient enough, we may find out. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The second question is um, from the TBI guy. I think that one of the major things of reality is variance. Everything in the entire cosmos, from quarks to super galactic clusters, varies and does so predictably. That's not a question, but that's what he said. Well, it's, it's everything is different. That, that's, you know, this is a tension, right? Mm -hmm. On a very small level, everything is the same. You know, all the matter is, you know, cr consists of protons, neutrons, and electrons, you know, mm -hmm. and then a few other elementary particles. It's more or less a few laws of physics. And out of this very simple few laws of physics and, and matter components, an enormous variation of this universe comes about. In fact, including ourselves. You know, we are made out of protons that, come, that came out of this, this Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And yet these protons, you know, are, look very different. I mean, just the two of us look different. Some people say, would say, you know, okay, we are not you know, representing a diverse couple here. But, <laughs> um, uh, but still, you know, very different. And, mm -hmm. and our protons actually thinking, you know, about the universe. So part of the universe is suddenly thinking about, mm -hmm. about the universe. Um, and uh, so on a small level, everything is the same. On a complex level, things become a rich variety. And, um, and we are sort of in the sweet spot of things that are somewhat predictable, but not completely predictable. And that makes life so interesting in the end. And well, uh, let's you know, go, thank God, you know, we're, it's not completely predictable. Well, let's go to the big issues then um, that you come to at the end of your thing. You talked just talked about entropy. So the, the way that, that the laws that we have determined um, are the assumptions that we're operating on is that the universe is becoming uh, more and more entropic as time goes by, that the matter is, is you know, dissipating. Someday it'll all be cosmic background radiation. You know, the whole thing um, will dissipate into that. And therefore, because it's in that state, not much work can be done, all, all that kind of stuff. And so we're moving towards that entropy. Um, we have no idea exactly how long it would take to get the universe to that state. Um, but it does seem interesting that while that's going on, and while the whole general process is moving in that direction, there are what you call islands of creativity um, which is like all of our lives here. You, you don't even need human beings. If you just go out in your backyard and you see an anthill or a gopher digging up, or you can tell by the, what's happened to the dirt that some intent has happened, some decision has happened that moved things in a way which wouldn't normally happen if everything was just tumbling along towards entropy. So that's where you, that's where you, you, you talk about at the end uh, of your book. I mean, is that... There would, yeah, be, it's, there would it's, be no order if there wasn't something that was anti-entropic. That's the way I look at it. 
There would be no islands of creativity. Now, it may be that those are just the minds of the gophers or, or any, you know, that might be the, the force. Um, but still, there's other ways of looking at it. So why don't you talk about how you, you think about it as a scientist that has worked on black holes? Yeah, I and mean, why is there something and not nothing? And right. why does it actually, you know, work everything work out? In fact, you know, there's this question of fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Why how is it possible that out of this chaos in the beginning, you know, all the natural laws, you know, work out in the end to to make us be human beings, right? And and there are, you know, a number of solutions to this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be multiple universes, but you know, it's not even clear that this this solves the problem at all. You mm -hmm. know, where do the laws come from that make these multiple universes? That it makes this possible at all, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 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 so, you know, what what is the origin of this all? And the uh, uh, you know, we, we we talk about Big Bang, and we don't go any further. In the in the old days, we talk about God, right? So we right. call this is the the beginning of everything. And we talk about the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we should be still talking about God in, in these days mm -hmm. uh, and talk about what God is. You know, maybe for, you know, for, for some people, it's just a collection of natural laws, you know, the underlying logic, the mathematics of it. Mm -hmm. For others, you know, that, 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 cre that, that first thing, the, 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 the source of everything is, is more than just, you know, something. It, it is someone, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like us to some degree, you know, so we are reflecting you know, we're, we, we have destiny, we have love, we have, you know, we, we, we have abstract thinking. Maybe that, you know, was existing in before the Big Bang. Maybe we're just reflecting that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the stability of, of the natural world reflects the stability of, of the creator of, of the beginning. Maybe, you know, us mm -hmm. reflects, you know, is a mirror of something, someone mm -hmm. that was in, in the beginning. Um, so it's hard to... I think you know I'm I'm someone who believes in in, in a personal God. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's not a crazy thought, mm -hmm. but I cannot prove it. Yeah. And it may be always a question of faith in the end, how we look at the world, how we interpret the world, uh, in in the end. Well, I um, think it would be helpful for everyone who, who struggles with this idea, or even doesn't struggle with it, um, to understand that word proof that you just used. You know, in science, there's very little proof too. There's just reliable evidence. There's better and better theories. Um, and proof is something that has to do with a very small area of mathematics, so to speak, uh, where you can actually demonstrate that this is, uh, always has to be true with these uh, parameters. Um, and so I think, I think because there's a, uh, obviously a lot of discussion about this idea from all the different major religions to uh, the secular humanists to, to uh, scientists, um, and I think if we all just say that there's no proof um, that this is, this is an idea that, that makes the most sense, and until you have an argument for why we have these islands of creativity against entropy, if it, until there's another explanation for that, then everybody should be able to speculate however they want to about exact. I mean, they will anyway. Uh, but but, th <laughs> that there's, <laughs> but that there's this, this is something that uh, doesn't have an answer that can be come to at a, at a scientific conference or, or at a religious conference, because it's just not answerable that way. I, I, I'm fundamentally convinced that that question will never be answered. It's uh -huh. fundamentally unanswerable. Um, you may find out um, that you know there's a certain physics that leads to you know why gravity has to be the way it is. You know, gravity by four for example, is, mm -hmm. is one source of, of, of you know, the, 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 the cr creativity, right? Because if, if gravity wouldn't pull things together, nothing would exist. It was just the universe, which was just exploded. So, you know, we needed gravity to work in this particular way to actually create something in the, in the first place. Now, you could, you know, can come up with some ideas, what, you know, try to, you know, why, where does this come from? But you always have this, this childish question that I had as a, as, as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. with, where does this come from? Or why does this come from? And I think you'll never come to a complete answer. And, and so there will always be a place for, at you, for faith mm. and for, you know, using your intuition and your feeling that tells you, you know, uh, how I look at the world and, and that I need to fill in with, 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 my, with, with my belief. Yeah, uh, you could right. say, okay, yes. I, I leave it just, I just, you know, take whatever works scientifically. Yeah. Um, but then you you may limit yourself to a part of the of the world and, and life 
uh, that may be, you know, too small. Too small. Uh, you, you, you could argue, you know, faith works. You know, it, it worked for my grandmother, you know, right. who, who was, um, you know, when she was dying, said, you know, I'm, I'm going home. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly gave her hope and, and, and supported her throughout her entire life. Um, who is there to say that, you know, faith doesn't work? Yeah. Um, no, they, you're, you're ignoring the facts. Uh, for some people, obviously, it works extremely well. And uh, you, you sound like you were an Aristotelian child, uh, you know, going back to your first causes there. Uh, that's pretty good as, as a kid. But uh, the, the, uh, the thing about the 20th century, which you point out, is that science decided if you can't measure it, you can't know it. But that, of course, you know, makes our emotions and all kinds of other things which aren't measurable, even our intelligence is not measurable that way. We can, we can pretend we measured it with IQ tests, and we can pretend we measure it with emotional quotient tests, but we're not really measuring it. We're, we're, we're making a very weak map, to go back to what we were saying before, of, of, of what that is. Um, so all those things aren't measurable. It's very obvious to almost everybody uh, that, that a big part of our lives is not measurable. And so that doesn't mean that reason can't get there, um, but measurements can't get there. So we can reason our way there. And you have to deal with it. You, yeah. know, you have to deal with your inherent unpredictability. Yes, you can, as you said, you can measure the electric pulses if you think, you know, and sometimes people say, okay, I see already you, 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 you know your decision beforehand, mm -hmm. but, uh, but you only meet, you know, it's, it's only a, you know, a little spark that you see of the entire process of your body making up a decision, you know, right, it's, right, it's exactly. entire, your, your entire history, your, your, your present and your future come together in making decision in, in the end. Um, and uh, you have to, you know, live your life making decisions and it will, it should be based on facts. It should be based on, on the science that you have, mm -hmm. but you cannot make it without hope without faith, without, you know, some projections that you make yeah. and, and some decision that yourself you take, how you want to view that world. Well, you know, science has given us so many exciting tools that people, of course, whenever there's a new idea, it, it's overdone. Uh, but like the brainwave patterns, I, I mean, they can say, well, in this case, you're, you're, you have these kind of brainwaves and so on and so forth. But that's a lot like to me uh, only seeing infrared and missing all the other, you know, all the other uh, radiation there is in the uh, in the universe, and, and only seen with that map, um, because our emotions aren't aren't reducible to that one thing, because you, you can get around that real easily. But we're running out of time, and there's one more question, and it's an interesting one. It's also a compliment, also from the Wonderfest people. Um, it's a compliment about your English, um, and and whether the English is a, is the uh, universal language of science. And the only comment that I want to make before you answer it is. Uh, Yes, but the French are very upset that the <laughs> that the English uh, took over in the 1890s or whatever as the language because the French were so close. You know, only 20 years. If it, if if everything had happened 20 years earlier, French would be the language that everyone would be speaking. So, so why don't you uh, say a little bit about how? I mean, in in my field, uh, in in business, in every field, English is the second language, uh, and it's an accident of history. We, I'm even talking to the French in English by by now. I, I yeah. you know I'm 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 frustrated. I don't speak French much better. I know it's a wonderful language. Yeah. Um, and a complicated one. So I'm I'm happy. I only had to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it could have been you know in in the in, in the in the 20s German was very popular, right? So I mean exactly. a lot of the famous scientists, the physicists were German. You had to read German mm -hmm. uh, to understand some of the the leading science, and that changed. And again, I think it was a a change for the better because you know English to some degree is simpler, um, <laughs> unless you know. Uh, dumb, it's dumb, dumb German. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has some relation to the German. I, you know, luckily, it's not Chinese or some some other language. It's you know, <laughs> much more difficult, and that is a problem for some people coming from other cultural backgrounds, right? Yeah. So, if, if in our collaboration, uh, your colleagues from Asia have a much harder time, of course, to communicate than, than we have. Uh, that is a bit of a problem, in, indeed. But uh, it, it, it's, on, it's on a good path uh, to, to uh, being a universal uh, language. So that's good. And, yeah, and, and the more, I, I, the more I, children I, I, learn it at a young age, um, the, the easier it is to learn it. You know, if you, if you learn the language before you're 13, 14, yeah. you don't learn it perfectly, but you learn the pronunciation, yeah. all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you took it in school. 
when you yeah were. but you know most important for me was to actually go to the u.s you know for three weeks or so yeah. you know yeah. touring the uh, california and uh, <laughs> into speaking watching television and, yeah, exactly. and talking to people uh, and that just just you know helped me to uh, you know cross that that bridge and start talking well, part of this internationalization of, of uh, the internet and uh, even the Commonwealth Club from San Francisco is this language issue. And I just one last little detail. The Netherlands, uh, where I know you've done a lot of work in your university, is, uh, is known for its really good English uh, speaking. And the reason is because, uh, that I read in a study, is because they, the population was not large enough to make it justifiable to translate the television shows. You just talked about television. And so the television shows were just beamed in from England in English or brought the American ones in. And, and if they're dubbed in France and they're dubbed in Germany and they're dubbed in the bigger countries, the bigger things, then the country that's too small is, has the advantage in the language because they had to watch it. They had to watch it in that language. I think that's true. Uh, yeah. in the, the Dutch used to watch German television. Mm -hmm. in the in the 70s and actually many dutch were speaking german and that's actually declining now mm -hmm. and now they're all watching uh, english uh, um, <laughs> shows in fact that you know they all speak very well english of course the dutch have a tradition of trade and and they are a, were a seafaring nation so it's in their dna so to speak to you know speak different languages and it's much less so in, in germany in, in, indeed yeah I, uh, that's true so sometimes being small helps you and the dutch are pretty good in making you know out of the, the small area they have uh, and the, the little, uh, quite a lot of impact. Another reason to be, for everybody else in the world to be jealous of the Scandinavians and the Dutch <laughs> and the way, the way they run things in their, in their countries. Anyway, that was a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, Heino, uh, for joining us. Uh, and so ends another event in the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.